the uh, first first order, I think, after roll call, will be the approval of minutes. We have. I, I wasn't here for the last meeting. Well, we have a motion. That has to be been circulated. Okay. Slides on circulated. So should we? That's what I was thinking. So I have a motion to. I will move to. Suzanne moves to accept. Um, and a second. I'll second. Charlie. And discussion. Sounds like Suzanne has something to discuss. So I, I went through this pretty carefully, so I do have a bond. It's, it's never a good thing. Like that. I, I, I use what is Google's equivalent of Microsoft tracking. So I am suggesting the following. Under uh, item number two, 2020 budget presentations, letter B. Uh, the last sentence is the part-time employees, however, do not get benefits or are part of the state system. And just for readers, I'm suggesting we say state retirement system. Let me just add that to make it clear what we're talking about. In letter C, Woods Run is two words. In letter K, uh, there were various ways to talk about the, what was an articulating loader. Right, George? That's what it is, articulating loader. So in one case, it's called articulate motor. Uh, so articulating loader, um, which would be smaller than the older one, and to which I'm suggesting we say smaller than the existing Bobcat skid steer. Joe asked, it was all up at the select board, this is about the CIP. And the answer was, it was said that it was, except for some of the Warren articles. So I'm suggesting the following, instead of, it was said that it was, except for some of the Warren articles. For clarity, I'm suggesting, and this is in there, by the way, so somebody can just go and accept it if the group says that this is a thing. As Hewitt said, yes, the select board will fashion Warren articles from the CIP. The Budget Committee has no role in creating or modifying Warren Articles, but it does recommend not recommend Warren Articles with financial appropriations. That's why I mentioned that that night. So it's just, I think, clearer for a reader. Uh, four, on the water and sewer request for emergency uh, expenditures, A talks about the rule and the the commissioner who was speaking, I don't know if it was Bob or Vern, uh, said this is an aesthetics rule, not a safety rule. And I thought it would be, again, helpful for leaders to, to include that. It was an aesthetics rule, not a safety rule. Um, in letter N, Angela Matthews abstained, not obtained. And it says the overall vote was a no. And of course, everyone so looking at this says, sees that there are more yeses than noes. And so, what I said at the time, which I will do again later on, according to S. Hewitt, a majority of the budget committee, or seven votes, is needed to authorize emergency expenditures. Therefore, the vote failed. That's it. And these are all in red line? They're all in red so line. On, on, on the, the, the draft. Yes. So, does anybody have any? Issues or concerns for the clarification. I wasn't here, so. Okay. Any other discussion on the, on the minutes? Have a, a vote to. Uh, well, should we re remove? Put them, put them forward again uh, as revised. I will move to authorize, accept, or whatever as, as per my revisions. Second. Denise? Oh. I'm sorry, I'm I just heard it coming from that direction. <laughs> uh, any more discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And I abstain because I was not here. That was an easy one. So next, next we're moving on to the pleasure presentations. Um, and first, I want to apologize to Mark. Uh, Mark's first the cemetery um, didn't find out about presenting today ahead of time, and so I don't think so. It's just a miscommunication. Um, so he has a budget, but he doesn't have the usual materials. Well, uh, uh, 
boss is making some coffees downstairs. I uh, came in to make some coffees. This machine's down. So, oh, I see. So he's going to make a coffee. Now, so. Okay, so while we're waiting, does anybody got, need a copy of the, the whole budget, which is going to have the departments in there? Okay. Colored? Okay. Yeah. I have mine. Well, I'm just going to pass them this way and that Thank way, you. and then you guys can. Yeah, whoever needs them. Uh, Caroline did the Expense or something that might change, make this change. In the well, future. I'm thinking uh, probably next year, and uh, what I'm, I don't have any prices on it yet, but uh, I'm looking at that 
that piece of uh, property, uh, you know, that open field area that we have on the, uh, coming off the overpass, and we are facing that field. Mm -hmm. Yes. We'd, we'd like to have a, uh, a survey of, to come in and, uh, you know, lay out a whole cemetery plot because we're starting to run out of, uh, we have a cremation area, uh, which we just started selling uh, graves in that cremation area. As far as uh, an area for full burials or stuff, we're starting to get. Uh, so that's already owned by the cemetery? Yeah. I see. Okay. Did you see so, a survey and layout might be coming up in the next year? Right. So have a survey and layout, put it all on paper, and then, then we can start selling lots there. But, uh, you know, it won't be for a while, but I mean, we, we still have some, some areas that we can go. You know, you've got. You get, we're selling all out of one area now, but it's getting down to, you know, uh, there's still some vacant lots all sure. over the cemetery, but, you know, people, uh, you know, they, they usually want to go in, in the area that's you know, wide open that's, that, that we've been selling out of. Sure, you have a question? Yes. Yeah, so, how, is any of this offset by revenue? You know, you sell new plots or? Uh, yeah, we, uh, we sell plots. And uh, like I say, we sell a, a grade, it's $350 per grade. Half of that uh, money goes into a trust fund for that grade, uh, which would be 175 The other 175 the town gets. So. But it goes into the general fund of the town then? I, yeah, I imagine okay. that's where it goes. Uh, yeah, okay. And uh, as far as the, uh, we, there's perpetual care on a lot of the uh, graves in the cemetery, but then there's some that you know, a lot of years ago that they didn't put perpetual care on. So, uh, you know, it's the problem we've had for the last, I don't know, maybe four or five years is uh, we're not getting enough interest money out of the trust fund. Uh, so, what's been happening is Dana, Dana is uh, the stairs uh, in charge of the, the trust. But, uh, he's, we've been going to the town and, and having the town pay the whole bill and instead of pulling money out of the, the trust because uh, it's not making up enough. Years ago we did, you know, and uh, you could go to that, but now it's just not doing it. So we haven't been touching it so, in the last few years. So, so Mark, is, is that in this operating budget? The this uh, the money for perpetual care that you that you have to no no but like like say the the Doe cemetery cleanup let's say it's 175 there's plenty of money in the Doe uh, in the Doe trust okay that's uh, that's a small cemetery that's on off of what slide on so that's no problem we, Dana will go to that. Uh, do cemetery, cemetery trust and pull out that $175 a year. That's not a problem. But uh, in the, uh, the new town, old town uh, trust, uh, it's just not there. But, uh, but what you're saying is... Uh, is it represented in your budget, the, that expense that's not covered by the trust fund? That no, no, it's not. Uh, I, usually when I... Uh, Give you all the other information, I, I, which I will. Uh, uh, it usually says, uh, you know, how much comes out of perpetual care and how much the town is supposed to uh, put in. But nothing is coming out of perpetual care. Right. So if but so, I, but I I list how much should be, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. So I get that. What, yeah. what I'm curious about is. Is that other part that the town is paying? Is that represented in the operating budget anywhere? If it's if, did, it, no, it's it's all in here. You're you're already paying it up front anyway. It's it is here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. So this is what the perpetual care is supposed to pay for. Parts of all of this. Part part of the the fourteen thousand and the two thousand. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Thank but, you. Sorry. The town's been paying the whole. Any other questions? How much is in the trust, just please? 
Oh, God. Uh, Roughly. Uh, I, I think it was something like uh, 120000 or something like that, if I remember right. In, in the new town one. I'm not sure about the old town one. Uh, I, I can get you that figure that I I, I know it's, I believe it's through Citizens Bank. I, I don't know uh, if, he, if he's bound to, he's going to invest it a certain way, right? Yeah, I don't know all the cemetery rates. I, I don't know. But yeah, it's, it's in Citizens Bank. I know, I know there are <coughs> cemetery associations, I think, have different rules than the, the town cemetery. Thank you, Mark. You've done a good job at Cemetery. Oh, yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, that was good, Mark. Thank you. Okay, Ed, are we going to present the transportation? Bam! Okay. I know a few of you. I don't know all of you, so for those who don't know me, I'm Ed Walsh. So we've had some changes this year over there, as you've seen, trying to enhance things, trying to come up with more creative ways of bringing a little more income in if we can. Uh, it's been challenging uh, throughout the whole United States, basically. Uh, in the middle of us changing over from uh, single stream to full sort recycle that we're doing, uh, China decided to close down a lot of the imports that they take. So it's quite a, quite a bind on all the recycle centers and all the transfer stations as we're trying to find markets for everything that we do. Uh, we have a good partner with uh, NRRA, which is, I can never remember the name, exactly what it stands for. Uh, no, National Resource Recycling Association. Yes, there you go. Uh, they're located in Epsom, and they handle, they handle this sort of thing for a number of different recycle uh, transfer stations. Yeah, as, New Hampshire. as like a broker to help, yeah. help find markets for Yeah, they'll help us find markets, they help us with education, uh, a whole, ra whole range of things. Anything to do with the transfer station. Uh, they're like a private organization, if you will, that would handle what the state should be doing, I guess, maybe. But they work really close with the state and with uh, DES and making sure we're licensed, we're making sure the operators are licensed. And, you know, uh, keeps things, keeps us on board, it keeps us on track. So there's a monthly meeting we go to every month that helps keep everything lined up that way. So as far as trying to market what we're doing, um, we use them for part of it. We use some local companies that we already know and already use. Scrap metal, for instance, uh, is Berwick Iron, is a couple of miles from here. It can be marketed through NRRA, but you have to have a large quantity. Burrow could come over and take whatever we got. So that, that works out pretty well. Uh, we use NRRA primarily for our plastics. Uh, I've used them for cardboard, and I usually price the cardboard through two different companies. I use them, and I use the company that we have always used. Uh, they're pretty close. So uh, the biggest thing is how the, the regulations and the specs, it changes almost monthly. One month you'll be, you'll, you can put one through seven plastic in a bin. The next month, yeah, you can put one through seven plastic in. But oh, but we, by the way, we don't want five gallon water chucks. So these are all things that we have to deal with and you know, keep the guys up to, up to date on. And, you know. So as you folks and the whole public are putting everything in the recycle bins, the guys up there are going through with their little nets and they're pulling out things that, that don't go. So it just makes it challenging, but it keeps us all on our, on our toes. So uh, 
So last year we changed from the single sort, uh, from the yeah, from the single source to the full separation. We bought a baler uh, about a year ago to bale the plastic and the aluminum, and that's working out quite well. We shipped out our first load of plastic. It took about 10 months to come up with enough to make a load of baled plastic to ship out. Uh, it was 23,000 pounds? Yes. Does that sound right? Uh, roughly 23,000 pounds of plastic that we shipped out. And that was, like I say, 10, uh, 10 months worth. I haven't seen the revenue. No, it's, there probably is no revenue from it, but what, yeah, there actually there is some revenue coming in from it. It's not huge, but what it did was it took that amount of weight out of our MSW, out of our regular trash. So rather than paying 60, 50 a ton to get rid of it, even if it's a wash, mm -hmm. it's a plus. Mm -hmm. So, and that's what we're finding with a lot of this. You know, it's, it's not huge money makers, but it's, it's cost avoidance. We don't, you know, we end up not having to pay. So, um, but it has, like I said, it has made it challenging, but we're working our way through it, and it's new to a lot of different towns, a lot of towns as well. So, um, <clears throat> it's also manpower is, you know, we got really good guys over there. They, uh, you know, like I say, they tend to really look and see what's going in. I got one guy that's been with us for about four years. And he's taken right on to the bailing side of it. Uh, he, several times a week, he's making bales of plastic. Tomorrow he's going to come in and make bales of aluminum. And uh, the aluminum, once again, we will do two to four to five bales of aluminum. We'll load it in our truck. We'll take that over to Berwick Iron. And that pays anywhere between, it's been paying anywhere between 20 and 35 cents a ton. Uh, 35 cents a pound for that. So. It's nice to be able to not have to warehouse a huge amount of it. Once again, if we go through an RRA, it's going to be truck loads, tractor trail loads. So some of these other things we can do ourselves and take right over. You might not get as much money, but we don't have the space to store it anyway. So we take it over there, you know, come back with, you know, two to five hundred dollars and put it back in the coffers. So it works out well. That's kind of my spiel on what we're doing and how we did. Uh, uh, also, a good thing, we I looked at a set of scales uh, this past May. I went to an NRA, NRA's conference in Manchester, and I just walked by a scale company, and I stopped and just looked and asked. I'm thinking scales are five, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000. No. They were cheaper than that. They were the the actual set of scales themselves were around fourteen hundred. You add a printer and some other accessories with that, and it's about twenty twenty five hundred dollars. New Hampshire, the beautiful through NRA, has a grant program. I applied for the grant. We were fortunate enough to get fifty percent of the money back. So we haven't received the scales yet. They've been ordered. Uh, Thank you to the select board for going ahead with that and authorizing the purchase. And uh, that way we're going to know exactly what we're shipping out. Because right now, right now we're up to the trucking companies. When they come and get a load of cardboard, they'll take it and they'll weigh it. I'm hoping they're honest. We don't have a way enough. So now we're going to have a set of scales. It'll weigh up to 5,000 pounds. A bale weighs roughly 1,000 pounds. So. We'll be able to know now exactly what we're shipping out, both in aluminum, anything that we bail. So that'll be a, a big plus. Hopefully down the road, if it works out, we want to maybe change the way that we're doing the demo. Right now we charge by the pickup truck load, which is, you know, one person will look at it and say it's worth $35. Another person may look at it and say it's worth $45. If we change and we do it by weight, it's going to be even. You're going to pay the same amount, you know, you're going to pay a, 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 a per pound, and we'll, we'll calculate that number based on what our containers will hold, what we typically ship out, so we'll have a number that is fair, and we'll be, hopefully, it, well, it, it will be covering what we're shipping out in, as far as demo and 
uh, construction debris and things like that. So, just more little changes that we're looking at and trying to make things more even and cover what we're trying to do. It's about where we at. So I guess that brings us down to the budget. <laughs> uh, are you, are you going to present the budget or Charlie, do you have a question you want to ask before you i got a question on the attendance. Sure. When you came in to see the select board, didn't you ask for 3%? I probably did. Yes, I thought you did. Yeah. It only shows two here. Yeah. Is this a selectman budget or your budget? It's what the selectman's book. Well, the one you're looking at yeah. is the selectman yeah. budget. Yeah. Shouldn't we have a copy of this? Did you bring any? I did not. That's why you have the selectman's budget. Okay. So we didn't know if anybody was going to bring them, so we supplied you with a copy. Yeah, but if he's got changes, shouldn't we know him? He's going to tell you what he asked for. And then we'll also, we'll also be able to deliberate on it right. further after this. So yes. This is the first presentation. You have this, this is the first time I've ever been no, no, you've this done a good with, job in. with everyone. So I basically, just I took what the selectmen had said they were putting forward, and that's kind of what I took as possible. So uh, I think I did ask for 3%. Yes. Uh, I had also asked to raise one of the employees' pay up. Right now, the rate of pay is. The stat is $11 an hour, uh, which is, frankly, it's low. Uh, Berwick just advertised for an attendant, a new attendant over there that they're looking to hire, and it was 1325 was their starting fee, starting rate, and we're starting at 11. So uh, I was trying to, hoping to get one of my attendants up to the low starting rate of the highway department here in town, which is. 14 and a quarter? Yeah, 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 right in that rail. That's the person that's been here for four years and does the bailing and whatnot. And he also bounces back and forth between highway if we need him on his days off. So we wanted to try to even that out. It didn't sound logical that if you're working transfer station, you're at one rate, and if you're <coughs> working highway, you're at another for that particular person. But um, talking to the selectmen and whatnot, they have agreed to maybe bring it up to, to 12, and that's what was put forward. So, um, we haven't lost anybody because of pay, but I don't want to lose anybody because of pay. We get some great guys. So, um, so anyway, down to the budget. Um, we've got, I think I budgeted for three full time attendants and one part time. That's what we've typically had over the last few years. We're down one person right now. We haven't added. We, lo we lost one person about a year ago, and I haven't added anybody back in yet, uh, just because we're trying to work through the budget. The budget that was put in last year that we're working off of right now is kind of an inherited budget for me. So we're just trying to work our way through it, and we've had some challenges. So. Um, can I, can I ask a question? Do we want to wait till the end? How would you like to do it, Ed? I'd assume do it as we go if you want, if that's okay. Can you explain the comment you have line about attendance that says two hours will be failing? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there is money in the, in that line. The, the, the attendants work 16 hours a week as a rule, the full-time, well, full-time, part-time attendants. They're all part-time, if you will, but their regular work week is 16 hours. Now, to bail the aluminum, to bail the plastic and whatnot, we can't really bail while we're open. Mm -hmm. It makes it very difficult. We don't have the manpower to do it that way. And frankly, it's a little dangerous to be running a, the skid steer around because we, you folks have probably been up there, so you know where you, where you put your material as far as your, your aluminum and your, and your plastic. On the down, the lower side of that, we open the doors and the, the bailer is right there, but you have to run a skid steer in there with a bucket, pick it out put it in the baler and make, make the bales. Uh, it's, I just assume not have them run around with the skid steer while we're open, while cars are coming in through. And people aren't walking around down there, but it's just not a safe way to do it. So what we do is we bring one, one person in while we're closed. And that's what that is, to cover that. Anything else on that? So, I guess, so you have one person by themselves working? 
One person can do the bailing. It's is it a dangerous job no. where he turns himself as though we're gonna No, we're we're right around anyway usually. Okay. And most of the time it's one one of these people are there and usually myself. Okay. So yeah. So it's very rarely that there's one person all by themselves. We're right in the area. Got it. So yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's what we have there. Uh the payroll taxes and whatnot are what they are. Uh, I assume you want to go line by line down through this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, conference and news is the next one. There's, as you see, a significant increase in that. But we also have a lot of training that needs to needs to be done. Each attendant has to have a operator's license from the state of New Hampshire. They get the initial license, which is an eight-hour course. Pass the test at the end. And then after that, every year they have to have three credits in order to keep the license, which virtually is three hours. Uh, so we have to pay them to go to that. We have to, the, the, some, most of those are not, doesn't cost anything to go, but we have to, you know, pay the guy to go. Like today, we, we took one of our part-time guys, uh, George and I went, along with one of the part-time guys, went to the NRRA monthly meeting. We were there for, you're going you're to kill four hours, but and you go up, you just go to the meeting, you come back. Uh, so that helps to cover that cost, you know, for those. Uh, like I say, I, I've got it in there so we have enough to do the full amount of people that we have. There's also a conference once a year in Manchester. Uh, I go to that and I like to take one person with me every year and every year I take a different person. And that's an all day course. It's, uh, I think it's a dollar amount that it is to attend it, but then it's just a matter of just going and, and being there. So that's where you see it says training for six people. Uh, George is also a licensed attendant up there too. So everybody that we have there, uh, well, George and I and Highway and the regular transfer station guys are the ones that, know, that have the licenses. And then, like it says, two to the annual conference. Uh, safety and, or health and safety, no change there. It's, that's primarily for uh, boots for our safety shoes and anything else that we need safety-wise, gloves. That's uh, primarily what what we need there. Uniform and cleanings, our guys are all uniform now. Uh, they have the, the safety stripes on their on their shirts and on their coats. Uh, it's roughly, it's pretty down close to being the 50-50 with our <coughs> So that's what that number is on that one. Supplies. Uh, <coughs> boxes for the fluorescent light bulbs, for the regular light bulbs, the mixed paper and the bailing wire. The wire is an 11 gauge wire, it's roughly 20 feet long, we use that to wrap the bales and keep them all together. The, uh, the mixed paper that you see in the cardboard building, that box, we buy those used. We can either buy and use, or if we're fortunate enough, when we when we send in a load of paper, they'll give us back boxes and pallets for that. We do have times where it lapses and we have to go buy some boxes, and they use boxes. I had to run up to Manchester, to Concord the other day and grab ten of them, so we didn't. We ran out. So um, once again, we have to come up with a tractor trailer load before we can ship out that that mixed paper, uh, which is. I think it's upwards of 25 of those big, they're called Gaylords, those big boxes. So that's to cover the cost of that. Um, Question on your mixed paper. Sure. You don't put shredded there, you put the shredded. Shredded actually just, goes shredded could be, sh the shredded paper can be part of the uh, mulch pile. Mulch, it goes in the mulch. It can be, yeah. And we collect that in a, in a container in the cardboard building. And once every three or four days, whenever it's full, it goes out and gets mixed in with the mulch. Yep. You can't put paper out there that way, but you can put shredded paper out there that way. So. And then, I, looking at this tonight, just before I came here, the word cash register was on there. I think I'm going to refer that one to the select board. I can that. <laughs> that was not on my original <laughs> request. Correct. Correct. Um, we have been advised by our auditor for several years that it would be highly recommended to have a cash register at the transfer station as well as at, at the uh, town clerk's office. 
it, it's a locked control, and it uh, I believe it also can give them a, rec a ticket receipt, which also is um, highly encouraged. So we decided that this is the year that we're going to do it. They're about two hundred and something. Is it two hundred and something dollars? They range in price. Yeah, but no, we're not done getting that great big, you know, Hannafin. <laughs> by no means, but just enough it has a security lock and, and um, both for here and next door. Yep. I like the idea. Yep. I mean, tonight really is the first time I talked to Caroline about that mm -hmm. wording and yep. she'd said that and I do like the idea. Right now, you come in, you give us a $20 bill for uh, $20 worth of debris to dispose of. It goes in a cash box. A handwritten receipt is done. The receipt is too bad. Uh, one goes in with the cash, one goes in just an envelope that we keep, or if the individual needs a receipt, they'll get that. Uh, then we have a ledger sheet that we also use internally that we double track it with. And then uh, my attendant that does the cardboard primarily runs that part of it. Uh, we very rarely ever have one of the other individuals come down and work that. That would only be if, if, and if he's out sick, I'm in there doing it. So. I want to get one other individual trained on it as far as looking at the material in the trucks or the pickups or whatever it may be and be able to do that. And I have one that is very capable of doing that, but they just haven't, haven't been able to work it into it yet. So, but there is checks and balances that we use right now. Um, on a regular, typical week, the individual that runs that Cadwood building, he's typically there for the 14, for this 16 hour shift. Every Monday morning is when we count the money. And the envelope is left in a locked box, a little locked safe, in the highway department building in our office. I'll take out the envelope, I'll sit there Monday morning, I'll count the receipts, I'll count the cash. And 99.9% .9 of the time it balances. There's always the one time it doesn't. I check with him, he'll go back through his receipts over there and his ledger sheet, come up with the reason why, and we balance it. So, and usually it's a case of a busy Saturday. He runs in with the with the twenty dollar bill. He sticks it under the cash box. Gets busy and does something. At the end of the day, he pulls it out, puts it in the envelope. There's no receipt for it. So we'll catch it at that point. And he's like, Oh, yep, I know what that is. I had three customers that came in, and the balance out. So. Because not everybody gets a receipt. No, you really don't get one at this unless, unless you ask. ask. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, everybody can get one if they oh, want one. Yeah, I, I've yeah. got receipts. It's very easy. Yeah. You know, he has to write out a receipt yes. anyway. It's a duplicate. So it's very simple to take out and hand it. So, yeah. So, but, uh, and you most likely we get the original. So the copy goes in with the cash at that point. So, yeah. So let's fix that. A cash register would not be a bad thing. Yeah, I think it would really. And I'd like the idea of one that would actually keep a tally of what we're, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, the uh, scales that we bought does have a printer on it, which will print out the uh, the weight, and on that, then we'll write down on that what the what the dollar amount would be, and that would in essence be the receipt. So, yep. Okay, so that's yeah. So that number is that number is up a little bit from what I had put in, but for this for the cash register, it's mm -hmm. great. Uh, the telephone, we're able to do away with that. We don't need that over there. We had a portable over there that works from my way. So we're able to save some money there. And everybody that works here has a cell phone. So it's almost redundant to have a phone over there. We don't use any internet hookup with a phone. There's no other, there's no alarms tied into it or anything like that. It's strictly a telephone. So now we come down to the tipping fees. Uh, library Regional tipping fees, the MSW is the regular trash that goes in the, the uh, compactors up top. There's one on the left, one on the right, we alternate back and forth. Uh, that number's going down a little bit this year, but it's still based on, I think, if I can ask the select person a question, did you up that number a little bit? Because I can't make that number match with what I have down for the tonnage. It's close, but... I'm going to ask the... Uh, so, um, he asked me that before, and I'm going to have to check it. Um, I, I thought it was the number that he and I agreed on, one mm -hmm. of the multiple times that we worked through this number, but um, offhand, I have to think that that was the number we agree on, but yeah. um, 
We can relook at it. We're yeah. going to take a budget committee yeah. after yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. We're not 100% firm okay. on ours. Yeah. Good part about it is this number is a little higher than what I had put in. So, yeah. which is fine. Uh, that's one thing that we're up on. We're up this year <coughs> compared to what we had had budgeted for last year. Uh, I budgeted this year, I'm looking at this next year, I'm looking for you know, 535, uh, 535 times of trash is what we, what we get rid of. Uh, last year, it was more in the 430 range. So we're up about 100,000 pounds. So, and I did put a little bit of a buffer in it, but that consistently we go through one of the one of those great big compactors a week. So when you go up there and you take your bag of trash and you throw it either in the bin or you know in the little hopper or you throw it over the railing into the uh, compactor either side that you're working on, we will empty one of those per week. And then, I don't think, but there might have been one week this year where we didn't have to empty one. So uh, anywhere between. 10 to 12 to 14 times is what we run a week. So I can consistently plan on having one of those a week. So, so our volume is up, our tipping fees per week. Tipping fees are actually holding okay. Uh, they were going to be going up this next year. The Lamprey Regional has done some Internal changes it was a meeting that we've gone to way after. It was only like a week and a half ago. They're going up a dollar a ton. Okay. So. But they are, um, sorry, Ed, but they oh, are sorry, restructuring Ed. how they are otherwise charging us because they were charging us above and beyond tipping fees in order to cover administrative costs. And they're handling that separately. Um, so the cost is split, but it should still be handled within that line. Yes. They've done away with, they used to have a truck, they used to have a driver, they had some internal people working for and with them. Um, they're down to just like what, one administrative person now for the board, the, the board that they have. Their treasurer is retiring, so that's not needed. Uh, we're going to be billed directly from... Uh, Waste management or turnkey for <coughs> excuse me for what we take up there. Where before it went to Lamprey Regional, I and mean, then Lamprey Regional split it all out and sent the bills out from there. So now it's coming directly. Um, Susan, you have any question? Well, I, I I think I'm just trying to understand these these two lines. I'm sure, and we'll get to it. But it looks like what we've done is split the tipping fees for municipal solid waste from the demos. Yes. I mean, it's the same tipping fee, but in order to keep track, I suspect, of yes. how much we're, so we can budget better. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also true that, that we don't get any revenue from the municipal solid waste, but with the demo, we have some revenue that comes in, and that's what we're trying to right. get the scales Correct. for. Yeah, when you, when you come in with a pickup truck load of uh, your back deck, for instance, you're, you're working on your back deck, you pull the boards up, you, you gotta get rid of that. Um, that's where we do charge for a pickup truck load of demo, for instance. Um, or it could be a sofa, a chair, a mattress, yeah. that sort of thing. That's all considered demo. That's how that all goes. How close are we to to recovering uh, our tipping fees from demo? Is it is it close? Will, will putting in a scale really help? I will, it's, it will definitely help make us know, let us know exactly where we are. Uh, Caroline can probably give you another. We're probably recouping. I intend to check these figures. What's clear is that we're not recouping all of the cost, and one of the primary reasons for that is that we are charging by volume, whereas we are charged per ton. And so the point of the scales, whenever it is that we can figure out the flow and the manpower to implement the scales appropriately, is to figure out a better structure for the fees so that we can make sure that we are recouping the cost because you're getting charged the same for a truckload of feathers or a truckload of bricks which is charging the town a vastly different amount of money so we're trying to separate those lines yes yeah, so that we can track the expenses separately but then we can tie the income to the demo line to see better how we're doing with that thank you john 
I have a point of order. I have no problem with Caroline talking. I think we should take a vote since she's not a member of this committee for her to give her input. And I'll make the motion that we allow Caroline to talk. Second. Second by Bob. Any discussion? She is the town administrator. I, 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 uh... I and she is a resident. Yeah. So. But she's not a member of this board. That's, that's why I also made the motion. I agree that she should talk. I'm just making the point. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Any important? Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. Did you have a question? No. You leave it. Okay. So back to the uh, Suzanne's question about the scales and whatnot. Even if we don't implement it immediately, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is randomly take a load that comes in, a pickup truck load. We're going to tell the people, this is, you know, here's where we are today, this is what you're going to pay today. But instead of putting it up there, I want you to put it in this bin over here. And then I'm going to take that bin and weigh it. And I'm going to do that, we're going to do that a bunch of times after we get the scales. And that will tell us, okay, if we charged, pick a number, 10 cents a pound, uh, which is a number that we kind of calculated out, but I, I want to refine that. But so if we take 10 cents a pound, multiply it by what they put in that bin, see how close that number is to the $35 that we charged them to get rid of it. So we'll be able to know. Also, what does a mattress weigh? What does a couch weigh? Once again, we're going to run through all that, and we may be, we'll, we'll, we'll be revising our fee schedule based on that. Uh, I don't see us putting everything that goes in the demo bins through the scales, for instance, couches, uh, overstuffed chairs, things like that, we're going to know an average of what that weighs. So every single one of those won't have to be weighed. You know, a queen-size mattress is going to be, you know, 85 pounds. It might be 83 pounds. It might be 92 pounds. But we'll, we'll at least have a lot better handle on what we're charging to get rid of that. And once again, it's, we pay by the weight, so it's not a volume. But where the volume part of it comes in is our transportation costs. Whether we take a truckload of mattresses up there that might weigh 1,000 pounds, or we take a truckload of uh, demo, which might weigh four, th uh, four, you know, four times. So that number stays constant. Every time they pick it up, it's the same exact number. So, so in the MSW, that's where we sit with that. Um, the demo, as Susanna pointed out, we, we have split that out. I think in the, in the past that's been all part of one number, but we need to know what, what we're paying, you know, what, what we need for money to get rid of that, and what, where we need to charge appropriately. So that's why that's on its own line now. And in general, those are those numbers are going up because we're seeing more volume. Yes, yeah. That's yeah. And the demo has gone up quite a bit this year over what was budgeted. And in talking to the uh, to the girls in the, in the front office, the town of Rollinsford had, I think she said 40, I think Kate said 45 houses sold this year. Now, as you know, if you live in a house any length of time, you're not moving everything you have in your house. You know, so there's a lot of clean out. So, and we've seen that. We've seen a lot of garden furniture, uh, old books, old magazines, old... Uh, Anything you can imagine you'd have in your house if you lived there, you know, sure. past 10, 15 years. So so that has, you know, when she told me that, it's like, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, yeah. So I know there's one particular home home in town here that's sold. Sorry, Ed, um, we've got like oh, sure. a, quite a okay. bit more. We'll move right on. So let's okay. stick to the stick to yep. No stories. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Demo hauling, uh, that number is up, but once again, it's, it's I estimate one and a half demos per week. We have two bins, and that number is worked out pretty well. So it's uh, and like so, there's one and a half I figure per week on an average for the year, and one MSW per week. Plastics um, and mixed paper, that's recycled hauling. That's just to have that 
hold off when we when we sell it or have to pay to have it shipped out. Uh, next line down, equipment that was up to thirty-three fifty. That actually could be decreased by the sixteen hundred dollars because we did buy the scales. So that's not a number that we need for next year. Disposal of metal tire, metal tires, etc. The metal part of it we actually get paid for, so that wording can be wiped off of there. But it's uh, Freon when we have the appliances pumped out, tires, electronics, bulbs, that sort of thing. Uh, we did change the way we did the appliances. Uh, rather than have the whole appliance taken, we pay eight dollars per appliance to have the Freon pumped out of it. Then we take the refrigerator or air conditioner, whichever it is. It becomes scrap metal, mm. so it's a plus. You're, you're so adding a line item, but you're but you're recovering more on the. Yes. You're not paying as much to get rid of it, so it's we were paying fifteen dollars yeah. to get rid of a refrigerator. Yeah. Now we pay eight dollars, and we get to keep the scrap metal. Oh, that's great. So it's just little things like that that's worked out. So lamprey waste, the closure fee, same thing, eight hundred dollars. That's uh, been the same. All the way through. Brush chipping. We have been successful this year in burning all our brush, and it is strictly brush. It's not not demo wood. It's nothing like that. It is strictly a fallen tree, uh, brush, anything on that. Any, anything that grows naturally is put in that lot. I mean that's worked out well. Hazardous waste disposal. Uh, Eighteen seventy-six is the the new number. Uh, what it costs to go to do it through working with Dover. Uh, mixed paper recycling. That's based on uh, twenty-eight tons worth. That's uh, about what it costs to get rid of that. Glass recycling. We pay as you as you know. There's a bin there to put glass in. Instead of putting it in MSW. It goes in the other bin, we crush it down, that's shipped over to, to Turnkey where they stockpile the glass and it's ground down from there and used as roadbed material and whatever the state deems it can be used for. So once again, instead of paying $68.50 or now $69.50 to get rid of it, we pay $35 to get rid of it. So that's a big, a big savings there. So that's all I got. Any questions for Ed? Well, just comment. Um, it's real clear the leadership that's going on both with you guys and the other department. And um, it's just run so much smoother and so much cleaner. My only comment is the fees, and, and I'm pretty much of a cheapskate, but you're not paying enough for these guys. Um, I, I think that ought to be considered, whether they say 2% or not, they're worth more than that. And any of us that have to hire people knows what the going rate is. It's a hell of a lot more than what you're paying. Just a comment. Thank good you. Job. Thank you. That's a few folks for that one. So. Thank you, Ed. Very good job. Thank you. By, by Thank any you. chance, would you get us the budget that you presented to the select board for me? Because when I vote on the budget, I like to know what the department came in with numbers and what the selectmen, not just going on the selectmen. Yep. Yeah, no, it's, it's really, really close. I yeah, think, I know it's close. I think the labor side. But when I, side I look at the budget, I like so. to know what the department yeah. has. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Thanks. So I'm going to hear back there. Good evening. It seems like every year the security gets bigger and bigger. There you go. I'm not supposed to. Are you saying we're playing on wing? I see more people at the table anyway. You were tables. Take my pass around, please. Uh, generally speaking, my budget uh, is almost identical to what the selectmen have presented. Uh, there are two line items in, in my proposal that are different from the select board, and we can certainly discuss that. Just a quick
quick review. Page one is the proposed police department. Page two, which is proposed animal control, emergency management, and capital improvement plan for the police. Page three is the explanation for all the changes for above. And page four, I've attached a police chief's salary comparison chart for you folks to review. Okay, well, we'll start with the, the, the easy item, equipment. Uh, I've requested $6,000 to be added to our equipment line item so we can replace an in-cruiser camera. The one that's currently in Cruiser 74 was originally installed in 2005 and is beginning to act up on us now. Uh, the microphone, the external microphone that the office, officers carry no longer works. I received a quote uh, today from WatchGuard and the microphone alone is $800. So, uh, we're, we're requesting to replace that unit in 2020, and that will complete the upgrade to all four cars. The court witness fees, we're removing $500 from that line item altogether, and moving that to overtime, so it's a 0% it's a change for anything, and the reason we're doing that is the state no longer pays for the police officers to testify in trials, so we are now paying our officers overtime to attend court for the trials. Okay. So that gets to the salaries. We'll start with, with the uh, full time. I, I propose three percent. Uh, select board has proposed two percent. You know, again, you know, we're we're trying to slowly get our officers up to what uh, what we're working against. You know, the last officer that we hired that just uh, recently graduated the academy, it actually took us five and a half years to get someone to fill that position. He was the fourth officer in five years to, to finally uh, uh, complete that position. And uh, part of it was because at least with one officer was, was the pay. He went to the academy, he served week in the academy, he got his paycheck, and then quit. Another officer did three weeks uh, of training with us and quit. And the first officer had an injury at the academy, and so that's why it took us to the fourth one. But it, it takes us, you know, to hire a police officer, get him on the road by himself. It's a, it's a year and just a little over a year in process. So, um, you know, we're already behind the eight ball when we lose somebody. So my plan here is hopefully that uh, uh, we slowly get the, the folks up to where they should be. Just to give you a quick rundown, the lieutenant has nine years of service with, with uh, the police. Well, 18 years with the town and, and a year and a half with Milton prior to coming here. His current rate is 3081. The average for a 19-year employee, a 19-year a 19-year service lieutenant, is 38 dollars and 68 cents in the state of New Hampshire. A sergeant with four years as a sergeant. We're paying, are currently paying, I'm oh, sorry, the 23.75. The average is 26.06. A two-year patrol officer, the average in the state is 24.06, and we're paying 22.22. So even though in the last couple of years the town has been generous and we, we did a pay adjustment for the lieutenant, we, this year we did a pay adjustment from the sergeant on down for all the full-time staff. They all get a pay rate, or adjustment, I should say, between six and seven thousand dollars, depending on their position. And we were able to do it by keeping within the police budget, so it did not cost the town any extra money to get those folks up to the 22-22. However, we are still a little bit behind the eight ball when it comes to the state average. So just have that in mind for you folks when we decide this. Two percent, three percent. We also no longer give straight across the board pay rates to everybody. It's actually merit based. Um, and I've yet to discuss with the select board how we're going to do that for 2020. You know, it'll be one percent across the board, and one percent or two percent merit or what. But uh, up until about three years ago, we used to give straight across the board pay rates, and now we're doing it on a, on a merit-based system. Any questions on the? I got a question on salary. Yes. Okay, what does it cost to train a police officer to go through the academy? We we're talking six, 16 weeks of his salary, yeah. and by the time they get back here, you're talking anywhere between uh, eight to ten weeks riding with an FTO, field training officer. 
So that's roughly six months. That's roughly one half a year's salary yeah. just to train somebody. I know it's not in the budget this year, but I was wondering, do you ever think of a signing bonus to see if you can get somebody that's got training before they can? I know, I think it was New uh, Hampton and Northampton. They had a signing bonus so that they could get a cop that has training. Well, how about we pay the folks here a little bit more money to keep them here as opposed to working elsewhere? I agree with that. Do we believe um, it's just salary they're leaving, or is there other reasons? Well, one officer, uh, Sergeant Stevens, retired retired last year. I mean, room for advancement and stuff like that may be reasons why they leave. I mean, what if, what if you were a sergeant for seven years and they want to become chief? They don't want to go option, right? Well, no, no. So you know, you see what I'm saying? But, but I do. So, so you've know, lost some yeah. good offices, and part of it is because there's no room for advancement. I'm sure paying well, is part of it. Well, but you got to look at the whole big picture. That's well, what I'm looking okay. And I have yet to have an officer tell me that they left because there was no upward mobility. Ninety percent of the time, it's been because of pay rate, pay, or, or they because it was such a small department that uh, you know they want to work Monday through Friday during the daytime. Yeah. It's just not going to happen. You know, they're going to be working weekends, nights, and holidays. So. With regard to the pay, um, I know everybody in this town always complains about this, but you and I have had this discussion for 20 years. This town is lucky to get anybody to work here. I know some of the people that you were trying to work here a few years ago who would love to have come here. They're not going to take a $20,000 pay cut to come from Bilbao. And the worst part is, you get these guys up to speed, which the chief is trying not hard not to do, but by the time you get them up, it's two to three years before a cop is really solid in right. their job. Two to three years. So you've got an investment. If they leave at the end of three years, you just lost all that time. And it's double salary because while that guy's in the academy, while he's out on the street, you have somebody else has to work overtime to cover that shift. So you're really paying two salaries for the first year pretty much. And if you can extend that out, you can, you can get quite a bit out of that. But right now, Manchester PD just had a piece in the paper about three weeks ago. They're paying 80 grand a year. They can't get candidates. Right now, throughout the country, I don't care where you're at, you can be an LAPD or you can be a Rochester, Brawlins fit, it doesn't matter. Only one to one and a half percent of those people that apply ever make it through the program. How many p candidates do you get per year? Slim, right? Well, usually, yes. Because yeah. part of the problem is they can't pass. Right. You know, when you go through, explain to people that don't know what it takes by the time they fill it out, the background check, the polygraph. Well, yeah, there's a set of agility test, obviously, there's a written test, there's a, uh, you meet with an old boy, you meet with a select board, uh, then there's a background investigation, you know, which can take, uh, a month or two, depending on you know, where the individual lives. Um, and then there's the time that you have to invest in purchasing all the equipment, getting the paperwork to the, up to the, the police academy, and then the 16 weeks that they're gone. And then they come back here, and then they have to participate in an in a 8 to, to 10 week, sometimes a 12 week training program. So it, it's a long process. Uh, but even before you get to that part, before you hire somebody, the pool for folks who want to be police officers now is down significantly. You know, like 10 years ago, there were a lot of folks who wanted to be police officers. Now, very few people want to be police officers. We've had people apply that have felony records, that have uh, to restraining what is issued against them, but they want to be a police officer. So right now, you're not getting the cream of the crop up there. You're really getting the... No definite felony. Not, not for everybody, yeah. but yeah. everyone's in the same boat. It's just how do you get qualified? Same, you know, the Navy Yard is the same situation. Yeah, but yeah, it's... But when we are in we're only starting to pay someone $19 an hour and they go to Summersworth and start at $24 an hour or go to Lee and start at $25 an hour. You know, that's where they're going to go first before they come to Rollins. Mm. So. When, you, when you say the shipyard thing, that's a big difference. You can work at the shipyard with all kinds of things, but you cannot get hired as a cop. And more you can't important, work at the shipyard with a felony or anything. Well, I understand that. But so a lot of the things we're talking I, about. I, I arrested three. There's no need to have this argument right now. We're talking about you. So. The point, okay. point of all of this is, if you don't pay these people more at the cost that we're going through for this, we're going to continue to have this. A town like this, most of the ones in Hillsborough and Rockingham County that I'm familiar with, when they get somebody in there, they're hiring guys who are looking to retire as part-timers, etc. 
So now you've got people who are fully seasoned, but they're not going to work for this kind of salary. Hey, um, I think I think we all understand that, that uh, the rates we're paying here are lower than the, the average and lower than our neighboring towns. And I think the point's made. I mean, I, I get it. I, I'm, like, I'm on board with that. Sure. So. And the last item is the, the chief's warning item. Uh, I don't think the select board put in, I think it was a $5,000 cost adjustment. I had put in for 83.12. The reason I say is, if you look at page four, I, I'm actually the longest serving police chief in Stratford County right now. But I'm second to the last in pay. And this here does not, obviously I didn't include Dover, some was with Rochester Durham, because uh, obviously, you know, they, we, we can't compete with them. But we should be able to compete with Lee, Milton, New Durham, and Stratford. You know, the Madbury Police Department, that is a, a, a department that is completely part-time, part-time chief, part-time officers. The state police handle the majority of their serious calls. Uh, they operate between 8 and 16 hours a day. They don't provide 24-hour coverage. New Durham, Stratford, Madbury, and Milton, they don't provide 24-7 on-the-street coverage like we do because they have officers take call at my time and the state police cover. We have always maintained 24-7 except in a really short time when we've had an officer on call. We've never had the state police come in. We've never had the sheriff come and cover for us. The, the comparison. This is the 2019 rates. This is your current rate per hour that you're correct. That you have for hours correct. Okay. And some of these elements, you know, the, the, their communities are on a July 1 to June 30 um, fiscal year. So some of them uh, have gone up. But, but these numbers are as February, are as, are as February 2019. You know, for those of you, just give you a little background for those of you who don't know. Uh, 2008, I became a part-time chief because at that point we needed a fourth, fourth, fourth full-time police officer because of our activity. And the only way to get that fourth full-time police officer was, was if I went part-time, thus you didn't have to pay me any more benefits, and that money there was applied to that position. So since 2008, you have not paid me for a vacation, you have not paid me for a holiday, you would like to work some, and you have not paid me any sick time since 2008. So, just keep that in mind, if you would, please. <laughs> Any questions on the police budget? Yes, I have one. Just um, the, something like the contracted services. So that's like 115. The, the budget for 2019 is 40 grand, yet you spent 15 grand. Uh, but then we're saying the budget for 2020 is also 40 grand. Should we, why wouldn't we? Drop that down to thirty thousand because the trend is showing we're not really needing that much. Because we were so short, the contract of service. That's money that the contractors pay the town of Rawlsford to have a police officer work at detail. Every source of that case might be. Um, this year, we actually refused more out of town details that we didn't have officers available to cover them because one of them was without cancer for a while. We had. The uh, one officer in the academy, and we had one officer that um, uh, had retired, and then one officer would quit that in December. So, if, if next, if 2020 happened to be a banning year for the town of Rawlins of working details, and we reduced that number, but we actually ended up spending $50,000 or $40,000 in, uh, in the contract of service, that money has to come out of some other line item. So, it's better to have too much in that line item. But if we, if we don't spend it, it just doesn't go in. But, but you get paid for it when you do do it. Right. By revenue. By revenue, yes. The town, the town actually, uh, we actually bill out more than what the t what the officers are being paid. So right. the town does, you know, make a little bit of money for yeah. for the uh, you know, the paperwork and the records and, and the bookkeeping and things like that. So. So if it and is, that's always a wash. It, so if it's almost always a wash, and I guess that doesn't show up. Where it would show that, up in the revenue. It shows up in the revenue. Revenues. And I guess, Caroline, that comes in as far as the overall net nets from a tax rate standpoint? Yes. Okay. And it doesn't really matter what that number is. Well, okay. it, it matters on the revenue side, I believe, because I, I agree with Chief. I mean, you want to have that number in the on expense side to cover what you think are uh, expenses and, and then some, so you, you never run short. We just need to be careful because I. I I was not so careful when I was doing revenue a few years back for the board, and 
we took that figure and put in the amount of revenue that would that come from us if we had done that full amount. Mm -hmm. But we didn't do that full amount for, for a lot of those same reasons that yeah. Duchamp just mentioned. And so that revenue didn't come in, and that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So when we're doing the revenue, that's when we need to be careful about contracted services. We really want to underestimate as opposed to overestimate. Just one question, uh, Chief. You, you mentioned we have to train people to the academy. Who pays for the actual tuition there? There is no, you don't pay for the tuition, that's paid for by the state. Okay. We just pay the officer to attend the training. So no matter how many people we throw at them, they'll train them and it doesn't cost us any more. Correct. We're, again, we're only paying their salary. Yeah, I know. But the but training itself doesn't cost us a ton of rolls or anything. Yes. It comes out of the state budget. Yeah, but is there any commitment on their part? So if we if they go through the training and we pay their salary throughout the training and they get certified and that do they have a commitment to the test? They have a three year agreement with the okay. town of Rollins. Yes. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm just curious, since two thousand eight you've been considered part time. Correct. What does that mean? Are you retired? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, so do you are you collecting a retired yes. town of retired? Yes. Not from the state. state. Oh, from the state. 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 Not from the state. Okay. Oh. So he's restricting the amount of hours that he can work. Correct. By collecting his retirement from the state. Oh. Okay, so how many hours do you work? 30. Okay. Allowed to work 32 hours a week. I work 30. There we go. On the record, I work 30. <laughs> Any other questions on the police part? Animal control, patient two. Uh, we increased that line, that, that, that section, by $71. That, that's roughly, uh, I think, uh, that's three, an additional three hours a year for the animal control officer. Emergency management stays the same. The capital improvement plan, $35,000. Of that, we will pay the second year lease on the cruiser that we're supposed to be picking up any day now, and the first year lease on the cruiser for next year, and then for the equipment for that year. The long-term plan here is that hopefully, once we get the cars with the mileage down, I actually might be able to skip a year and then save the town some money in the long run with the vehicles. Currently, we have one vehicle, the one we're planning on getting rid of uh, this year, it's already, actually, it's, already been, it's actually already sidelined as part of the highway uh, pond, 140,000 miles on that right now. And it needs some significant uh, repair work. The 2014, which we're planning on getting rid of in 2020, uh, that currently has 135,000 miles on it. I anticipate it will probably have close to 185,000 miles on it by the time we get rid of it. The 71, which is the 2016, that currently has 70,000 miles on it. I anticipate that's probably going to be closer to 100,000 miles this time next year. And the 72, which is the newest one, the one that I drive, that's currently got 18,000 miles on it. Any questions on the vehicles? Okay. Just a, a procedural question about, about how to fund the police vehicle. Wasn't there an issue with uh, using the CIP reserve fund to do this? Yeah, there was a there was a uh, form um, contained a clause saying that we could um, get out of the lease, and that prevented us from using CIP money to purchase it. So we had to take it out of the operating budget. Twelve, 000, twelve, 000, how much was it? Twelve thousand. Just under twelve thousand. Yeah, just under twelve thousand had to come out of the operating budget this year. Oh. But you're anticipating writing the lease so that it, it well, be able to... it's the Warren Art that was written. Right, but you. We won't have that clause anymore. Yeah. It was so, so we won't have this. It was the language of the Warren article. Okay, so we won't it, yeah, we won't make sure that doesn't happen again. So, and, that's the, yeah. and that's the only CIP related item that this has, right? Yes. So this, the FEMA reimbursements, that's similar to the contracting services somehow. It's, it's in the budget, but it's revenue that comes in from the federal government from FEMA? Correct. And what do we do with that here? I mean, what does the police department do? To we, we, that we uh, the money that comes in, the, uh, it's used to reimburse the town um, for expenses for, for the vehicle use 
anyone who does overtime, any equipment that's used, uh, sand, salt, whatever the case might be, um, signage, things like that. Just to make sure, you know it's not a guarantee to have that funds. It's only Correct. if you applies for it, we have to qualify for it. It has to be particular storm relation or, or something. Right, so it has, it's to, not it has, something it has they to be a year. declared storm by the federal government in order for us to receive any money. Yeah. So it's in the budget as part of if something awful happens, we're budgeted for it. We can collect right. it. Yeah. Yes. Any other questions? So basically, these are finance leases. Yes. And that's why you're able to be flexible with uh, with the term on them. Well, they they offer you know three year lease, four year lease, three year lease. So. So we're doing three. We we, did, we we've been doing three year leases. Back in 2005 and 2008, we leased vehicles. Then after that, we started buying them. And then we got to the point where we got really behind in the mileage because one year one of our vehicles got totaled on Portland Avenue and we got hit in the back. And um, uh, we, that vehicle was never replaced until a year later. So that put in a, a lot of mileage on the three remaining vehicles. So now we're just trying to catch up for what happened with that, that newer vehicle back in the day. So it's easier to budget this way, basically. It is, yes. Yeah. As opposed to one, you know, you, you purchase the vehicle, you, you get a big expense, the next year you don't have them because you're not buying one, so this way it's just it's even across the board. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can't even come close to that. 
Because your point system is really it's a bad nothing. system. No, no, it's not. It's what works for us. Okay. You understand how we're how the system, how the station yep. is made, and how this town yep. accepts its risk by running a fire department that's on a call basis. You'd understand. Because now your point system is based on one through six. For the first system. hour. So why don't we get started with the whole budget? Let's go yeah. through the budget, and we'll go back. Can to him, okay. Would you can we have Mark at least present his budget, and then yeah. he can ask questions? I agree. And this is. There's only a few areas within the budget. The budget basically will fund it except for four different items, five different items I think that I have. We can flip over to the fire department page. I'll just go right down through them because they're very minor adjustments. Um, I'm going to skip past the salary one right now because I asked for a five thousand dollar bump. Page five, Yeah, down in the one you get the one forties range there in the fire department side. Um, First thing we're looking for is uh, an increase of $1,000 on the line item for uh, computer equipment. We have some computers at, uh, in the station now that just don't have the ability to, you know, like everything else, they don't keep up. They need software upgrades, they need some replacements. So we're going to ask for a $1,000 increase now. Uh, as we come down, supplies, just for maintaining the station, a couple hundred dollars in just for our normal stuff to be in the bathroom, in the kitchen, and and whatnot when we have people in the station for extended periods. The office supplies increased there $500. The main reason for that right now is we're seeing a market increase in requests when we go on a call from insurance adjusters, fire investigators, wanting our reports and our information so they can set up whatever their cases are. A market increase in that. Just about half the calls we go on now. I'm dealing with lawyers and insurance companies over there their needs to settle whatever cases they have. So with increased cost of that just to generate what we need, we, we need to increase that. And the last one there is under protective clothing, $2,000 bond. Um, and that reason for that is, again, just because the cost of the clothing for a firefighter. Does anybody here have an idea what it costs to outfit a firefighter? A lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right now we have 22 members on the fire department. I want to give, I try to replace two or three sets of gear a year. As you can see, the line item before is, what, seven, and we want to go up to nine. Um, so I can keep that regular progression going. It's just, and that's just for a turn -out. That's not counting some of these helmet boot gloves and everything else that has to be involved, so. Do you have the total of what it costs to outfit somebody? Yeah, with everything that they need to have on their back, it's close to seven thousand dollars. It's not counting the air pack. The air pack's not six thousand dollars. Each one has their own. So the cost is exorbitant in this action. How many radios do you have now? Have you got any radios at least? Or most of them. Radios. Is this a spinoff from last year? No, I'm wondering if you got them all finally. Yeah. yeah. That that well, you came down actually with one of the members that decided yeah. to come down when we went through the station. Yeah. But you wanted 15, have you gotten at least 10 of them yet? Yes. Good. We have. Okay. To answer your question, as far as all the fire trucks, they've been upgraded. Good. All with brand new mobiles. The base station within the firehouse has been upgraded. And the portables, we've received 12. Okay. I know that was one thing you had to go through. So it's huge also, because we've been talking. Most of that, so that's good. Yes, that's a major upgrade for us right there. Is our <coughs> communication. That's, that's gone from you know, stringing a wire to being as good as it can be. That's good. So those are the only things that I'm looking to ask for a little bit more of increase as far as the line items go in the fire department. Again, not to set off World War III here against the points, because I don't understand the points at all, but I do understand how much you have to pay to get somebody to work. How are you guys not getting paid at least a minimum wage? Because if you look at the salary line, it's $51,000. Okay. So the way, the way the point system works right now, I, like I said, I'd like nothing more than say, here you go, guys, it's 10 bucks an hour. Even then, that doesn't come close to that, but it should be compensated at. The point system that we have now is when a firefighter comes in for a call, he earns one point per hour. So if we come in for a call, most calls don't even take an hour. But there may be times, like you know, last month, we were doing it for six hours for the fire they had on Central Avenue. So for every hour, you're earning a point. What does that accumulate to? What happens is that we that that uh, fifty thousand dollars salary is divided quarterly because that's how the members are paid. 
So we take that a quarter. It's twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars a quarter. So for all the calls that everybody comes in for, they sign a log sheet, and after that quarter, we take all those points and we put them together for one number. They're also paid for the monthly one night of monthly training that they're required to be there for. But they're there every Monday too, though. Aren't they, they are there every Monday, but they're not getting paid to be there. Okay. One night we have a training night and a meeting night, which will put another point per hour. They'll get three for those hours. Three points because we're usually there from six to nine. Basically, and there's even times when I'll have guys because I can't do it myself. There's not a single person within that fire station that does not have a full-time job. There is nobody that's 100% dedicated to take care of the needs of the fire department. I do as best as I can. I put easily in two or three hours a day, every day of the week, and that's not counting calls, just to take care of what needs to be done at the fire. Okay. So when all these points are accumulated, say we have you know 2,000 points for the calls we had for the for the three months, that gets the sum that gets divided into $12,750, and it comes out to what everybody's going to get, which Charlie has sitting in front of him. Hmm. And it depends on how often you're there. The points are also set up for as an incentive. You aren't going to get paid if you don't come in and participate either in a call or the other things that you have to do around the station. So yeah, I look at the sheet too. yeah, yeah, I got a couple of them. So follow up to that. Go ahead. Again, I understand one of the points. Yeah. But why the hell aren't we paying you ten bucks an hour? Because I pay more than that for unskilled helpers. Why are we not? Because yeah. there's not that money in the budget. So silly question. You got fifty thousand dollars for points, right? Fifty thousand dollars for a year. Right. Yeah. And that was a. Hypothetically speaking, if that was $100,000, would that help? Oh, yeah. That would help immensely. That would help a lot. Okay. It would help immensely. But the thing is, you know, I sit there and listen to Chief Bouchard talk about his people. It's the same thing that we fight. Understand one thing. We're a call fire department. When the tone goes off, members are asked to show up. They don't have to show up. That means whatever they're doing, whether it's Thanksgiving dinner, Christmas with their family, sleeping in the middle of the night when it's 10 below, roll out of bed, get in your car, drive to the firehouse, jump on a fire truck, go on a call. That's what these guys are asked to do on almost a daily basis for the amount of calls that we're stuck doing. We are basically a, a training ground for our neighboring communities. What happens is we bring our folks in, we train them. To train a firefighter, to get him certified in firefighter level one and two, is roughly 400 hours of schooling, six months. We get those people, we have them sign an agreement with us that they'll save, stay for two years, which, which really basically doesn't happen. So they stay with us, they're fully trained, but what they're doing is they're building a resume. They're with us, they go on calls, they show they're affiliated with the fire department, and because they are, we can get reduced costs on their training. <coughs> we said one member that we sent to the fire academy in Concord, which normally costs $6,300, in three months of training, become certified because he's affiliated with the fire department. It's cut in half. So he finished his time, got himself certified. So he's with us. He's running calls. I have another guy that I can put in a burn building because he's 100% fully certified. He's interviewed with Portsmouth already. He was in Dover last week for an interview. So he's on their list. He's not going to be with us much longer. I have another member that was in Dover the other day and did not get an, an, another interview. He's going to Salem next week. So we're a constant revolving door where we bring people in, we keep them for two, three, if we're lucky, four years, and then they fly the coop. Like a feeder system. That's what we are. I have a list on my desk of 80 names since I've been on the fire department that have gone through the Rollins for the fire department and are now permanent somewhere else. I use that as a recruitment tool and a retention tool. Most of the chiefs in the area, the chief meetings that I go to, and they have people that are looking to get in the fire service. It's just not something where you can just walk off the street and get hired anymore. There was a time when that would happen. Not anymore. You have to meet these minimum qualifications to be an EMT, have all your certifications, and anything extra is only going to make you more marketable. They come to us for that. These neighboring chiefs will send these individuals to us. Because I'm not going to say no. If I say no, I probably won't have anybody. 
Okay, so we put them through, we work them through this stuff, we get them trained, we're viable for us for as long as we can have them, and then they move on. What do you think is an appropriate amount that you should have for salary for them? Appropriate number? Yeah. You mean as far as like an hourly wage? Yeah. Every fire department, the lowest paid fire department that starts anybody in the area around here is fourteen dollars an hour. That's the lowest rate. Everybody else is way up from that. Suzanne? Well, so again, try to understand this. The the ten thousand dollar increase that's in this budget void premium, whatever it is, to fifty six thousand. Uh, would would only bring people to the New Hampshire state minimum wage? Is that do we have to understand that? Well, I'm not even sure if that'll get us to this. No, 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 no. not with the number he's got. No, I don't think. You see, the thing is, the other thing you have to realize too is, <coughs> ten years ago there was probably a dozen guys that lived in our community that responded to the fire station and were there in a very quick amount of time. Right now, there's five people that are on the fire department that live in town. Five. Everybody has a full-time job. So a lot of what I was trying to do to get to this point is, there's coming a point that's coming very quickly that the fire station is going to need somebody there, at least daytime coverage. And if it's not somebody full-time that's sitting there as a firefighter, there needs to be a program that I've been starting to work on this that would put somebody on a call basis. Meaning that they're going to be paying 50 bucks a day, 100 bucks a day, whatever we come up with. So that if there's a call, they could be in the station in three to five minutes to get the truck. Because there's times and it's, and it's, it's not an enjoyable thing. Because I live with a stone's throw from the firehouse. So the tones go off and I walk in and I don't know who's coming. I have no idea who's going to show up. Does anybody here know what the national standard is when you're supposed to get a fire truck on the road and be on a responding mode to an emergency? Six minutes? No. Three to five minutes. That's the national standard. You're close. You're very close. Yeah, like I guess. You're very close. Is that for rural or city? That is a national standard. They don't differentiate between the two. But we all know throughout New Hampshire. I do. They're and way I'm, slower than that. Yeah. Oh yeah. If you go further north, they're lucky they have enough people to even manage anything. I'm lucky because right now we have 20 people. So uh, we're managing very well what we have right now. But those numbers fluctuate. Again, those guys are hired to go off to other fire departments. So, getting back to the point where I've been in the firehouse for two or three or four minutes by myself, hoping somebody else comes. And there's been times when I've got the fire truck down by myself. Is that something that you should do? No. The national standard on a fire engine is three, three people. I can't wait any longer. It's getting to be six or seven minutes. Somebody's got an emergency. The fire truck needs to be on the road. So what I'm leading to under this is the fact that our daytime coverage is like rolling dice sometimes because I don't know who's available. We have some members who work on local fire departments that do shift work. So there's other days when they're off. So I kind of have an idea when they're available. I work a lot in the area. I leave where my job is at that point, and I'm always going back to the firehouse. So I do have somewhat of a working knowledge of who's going to be there. But it's never Can that. I ask a question? Yes. Is I am responding operating? It is operating. So that is your. That, that's we even know who's, who's coming, coming, right? We that's just one authorized step that. Now that I know. Okay, because so we I, just authorized I, that this year for you. And it's happened, and it's up and running. Awesome. It's another. It's another dispatch tool that we're using. <coughs> Before I didn't know it was coming, but now I have a, We have an app on our phones yeah. that when a call comes in, it notifies you to go. It tells us where it is and whatnot. But also to the point now, all members of the department have this. They can go in there, punch that up, and they can th scroll through and tell me that they're available, unavailable, they're responding, they're delayed. So now I have an idea. You've got a screen at the station that's, that's going to yeah, tell you who's coming. The screen's going to tell me what's coming when I want. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. so I have a question for us. Would you appreciate knowing three things? What the, the, the currently proposed fifty-six thousand dollars? What the how that relates to sort of an average hourly rate for, for the fire. And then, and then would we like to know what that figure would need to be in order to pay ten dollars? And would we like would we like the town to calculate what it would be to, to 
did you say, was $14 a local on-call? Is that an on-call? It's like a starting wage for a lot of, on, a lot of the fire departments. You would, would at least like the town to calculate that so that we know that? Would the committee like to good appreciate idea. that? The two lowest paid are South Berwick, because they're still in a call mode like we are. And what is their? We're one, they're 14. Okay, we're so, one of the last remaining fire departments that operates this way. So my, so my three-part question is, what roughly, yeah. as an hourly wage does that 56,000 represent what would it cost what would the budget be if we wanted it to be ten dollars an hour and what would it cost if we wanted it to be fourteen dollars an hour so at least we can see those figures does that does that seem like it? it's one of yeah so just hypothetical the hundred thousand I said originally would that be above minimum wage is fair to say okay I would certainly say that would give us a Again, it all depends what kind of calls you have, how many hours yeah, of call, see, no, how many people you show got, up. I mean, it's, it's, it's really kind of a, it, yeah. a guesstimate. Right. It's not like you know, if there's a callback, you can say, I'm going to get six guys or seven guys from a fire department shift. When we have a call, I want everybody there. Because the other thing that we do is we don't call in a lot of mutual aid to cover us when we're busy in town or on another call in somebody else's town. We take care of that ourselves. So I have to have everybody come in. That's how that we maintain our people. We can't maintain our coverage ability. Otherwise, I could say, nope, I only need the first five that come through the door. But that doesn't cover our needs. How long has the point system been in place? A lot of years. It was when I first started. I've been on the fire department 31 years. And I've been sitting in the fire chief seat for the last seven as the assistant chief for <coughs> stipend at the end of the year and it was 100 bucks. So it's evolved and it's increased. Two chiefs ago, he initiated the point system to start to be able to compensate the members, bringing them up into something. Because otherwise you weren't going to have anybody. Nobody can donate their time anymore as a volunteer and give what is required to do this stuff, especially with all the requirements and certifications that you need now in order to be able to operate correctly. And if we don't maintain these, uh, there's going to be lawyers and lawsuits and whatnot if things did not go right. So, so is it fair to say you could take the historical data of how many points people have to figure out how many hours we have over a certain amount of time to guesstimate how many wages you would need? Uh, that that might be a way to start, yeah. The point system, it, it, it sounds like it's confusing, and I understand what you were talking about, Charlie, and how it's going to work. But, as we, point per hour, wouldn't it? Yeah, basically, like I said, we take those points and we throw them in the pot and we divide them into that one quarter of a pay, and it gives us an hourly wage. And I usually put that down on some of the sheets that I have in the fire station. In the last few last few years we've been doing it, we've been averaging just under $7 an hour. That's where we've been. I mean, it just, I'm sorry. It just sounds like I am thinking this point system is really just like a tip pool. We're all said and done. Yeah, yeah. That's Everybody right. who <laughs> worked that quarter is going to get a, an even portion of that it's too. As a much as you want to put it that way, I, I can't disagree with that. Yeah. 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 And, the, and the reason why we don't just pay ten dollar, you know, a ten dollar point or whatever it is, is it's not that. Why are we doing the point system and not paying an hourly, like an on-call rate? Is it the, what's because the money's not there. Well, yeah, that's that's, that's not really a good. Re I mean, is there a reason other than that? I mean, we're talking about possibly looking at other ways to, to boost the number. Why are we doing this complicated point system when you could say for one hour of work you're getting whatever your hourly rate is based on? Which that's what I was trying to figure out. That's the way it would work. Yeah. But, but why doesn't it? I mean, is well, it, because is, the budget committee last year reduced that line by five thousand dollars, if you recall. But nobody's I mean, put forward a. Everybody's talking about a point system that's hard to understand and hard to hard to get an idea of how much people get paid. But we're not saying that for each for each firefighter, uh, depending on their level, they're getting paid some hourly rate, just like a cop is paid a certain number of dollars per hour. Why are we doing this point system? Why aren't we just doing it straight pay? Like, well, I think the reason they do, I don't want to speak never had the reason they do is they don't have money. Never had any money. Well, but I think John's saying. We should just change that. Right, I know he's saying that. That's the reason why I do it. It was never there, John. I get it. How it was. The money was not. I get it. So it's just a transition. We're trying to increase it to get to that point. And if it never got to that, cross that line, it 
it goes as points. I don't need it anymore. I know I have this amount of money in the budget on the salary line items. It works out to that nine, ten dollars an hour. We're good to go. And believe me, it would be so much more easier to retain and to recruit people if I could give them some, some information. Psychologically, is it because you know who wants to know that they just you know risk their life for like you know five fifteen an hour, two and six bucks an hour? I'll make it. I'll make it. Whoever, who got these copies yeah. from Mark has to turn them all back in, please, because it has confidential information on it yeah. that cannot be shared. It is address. You can get another one at a later so time. I'll take it please. Send one? We'll send you a report. I'll get you another one. Yep, yep. about that. I don't need to. Anybody have else have it? Okay. There's one on the floor. There's one on the floor. We'll get that one. Just, um, if, if I can, just thank so you know, they're paying twelve fifty an hour to start at Home Depot. Thank you. That's all you need to know. So it's kind of an insult Thank not you. to pay at least that much. So maybe to refine my original request, maybe maybe we don't need to have people in the town administrator or the fire department, like, like Paul just said. I mean, if this is roughly covering maybe seven bucks an hour, fifty-six thousand. If you increase it to a hundred, you get closer to the fourteen dollars an hour, roughly. So maybe that's sufficient for us to play, to, to sort of play with. Mark, can you supply the amount of hours for a year? Uh, hours for what? The, total, pay the total, total pay hours. I mean, you go by points, but are you able to convert that back down to every call? Like, because you have call logs, so you know what your hours and are, hours and you know what your training. So, if you could give us a year worth of hours for, right. and it, it will change, and I know that, so you have to have a buffer either way. But yeah. if you can give us a year, a, a well, calendar year, I would say I can probably break it down on a monthly basis, which might be better because it's 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 all variable. Um, I mean, we may, we may have a month of July where we don't do much, but then during this last month with the windstorms and everything, we've been out constantly. Mm -hmm. Now that the weather's going to change, we're going to be out constantly. But I'd rather just give you lump sum. This is how many hours we work on. Try to make it a little bit more on an organizational type of thing so that you can see how it gets to the end point. Well, that would help them yep. to understand how many, and it certainly would help you with the doing spreadsheets or something if you needed that. Okay. Also, so there's there's no different value for a point based on one of the fighters' skill levels. No, so the only ones that earn a little bit more is the officers. Yeah. Okay, so that would have to be. are all the same. They're all the same. So the office, from a salary standpoint, I guess, we're trying to come up with you a different benefit. You would get benefit the captain to the chiefs. Yes, okay. that's the only difference. Is he's as much those guys. But I mean. Yes, I mean, in the real world, the more certifications you have, the more that you're getting value, so the more you're going to get paid. Uh, this is what we're doing. It's just, I don't have the ability to do that. And it's as complicated as it may seem now in the point system. We start doing something like that, it's going to go wrong to everybody. So. Oh, I have a question. Just, I know we're talking about increasing salaries, and, and I think I appreciate we said to everybody, I'm cheapskate and I think we spend a lot, but when it comes down to people, anybody that's tried to hire knows this is a tight market and we're not even in this town paying close to anything realistic unless you get to the school department who we pay, in my opinion, exorbitant rates compared to the other towns around. So there's the, I always thought, I'm new to this board, but I always thought budgeting was making a determination like in your own house. Hmm, I'd like to go on a big vacation, uh, but I need to do a transmission in my car, you know? And we've got somebody who's getting less than wage, and we're paying, you know, $110,000, what is it, uh, $22,000 uh, to send somebody to first grade here, and we can't figure out how to knock a couple bucks off of that so that these guys can get at least 10 bucks an hour. Like I said, Home Depot, 1250 to start. I talked to somebody that just started there the other day. Yeah, I, mean, I agree that we should pay a five and more, don't get me wrong, but what you're comparing is really not a fair comparison because the firefighters all have full-time jobs. I, I this understand is like that. This is like their part-time job, so to speak. Don't right. get me wrong. 
But so if it was a full time firefighter in that position, absolutely. If he was here forty hours a week, he should be making a salary. But that's not the situation we have right now. I, I agree, we should be paying him more. But you would care compare him to a full time worker, whether it's somebody at Home Depot. No, I'm saying I'm saying there's ways you can give less of a raise to one side and balance that money out and still keep within the budget. Just like oh, okay, I see. yeah. I'm not saying you you cut their salaries out. Yeah. I'm saying you balance the salary. These guys are getting nothing. Those guys are getting. So that would be also looking. We only we only recommend budget. They. All right. So I, just my question. Okay. Right. I think we got it. I think we understand. I think I think the we understand now what we're dealing with. We'll get some more money, more more estimates of what the uh, cost would be to pay everybody at. $10, $14 an hour just to make them comparable at least to minimum wage and, and to what's neighboring communities. And that, that's something we can look at when we deliberate over the budget um, further. Is there any more are there any more questions for can I have a clarification yeah. from Caroline? Sure. Okay. So knowing that this would be a large number, yep. can it be on a warrant versus putting it in the operating budget? And my reason for asking that is SB two. Because if SB two if it fails, we go back to, everyone goes back to yeah. last year's budget. So I'm fearful of putting something in the operating budget, but can it be a warrant? I would want to look into the implications of that. I think technically yes, but whether or not that's a good idea, I'm not sure. But it's it's an interesting point, so okay. I'll we'll get more information it. on that yeah. going forward. Or discuss it. Just one further clarification. Understand one thing. The members of the fire department here are no different than the members of the fire department in Dover, Summersworth, New York City, Chicago. It's the same thing. They all have the same level of training. I wasn't trying to insult you. I'm not. No, and I'm not going there. I just, I just want everybody to realize here that there is a very valuable, skilled bunch of individuals up there. The root of us, the root, probably the five or six of us that have been there the longest, and, and getting into the fire service is just not a job; it becomes a lifestyle because you just have to drop everything at the drop of a hat and go serve. It's just the way it is, and the way this town is set up and wants to do it on a per call basis, rather than paying somebody at a full time rate to have them there all the time, is part of the risk that the community is willing to absorb based on response time. Because the response times is this critical component to the whole fire service scenario. And the other thing that I was trying to do when I said I need to get this to minimum wage, if not more, is the point where, and I explained everybody's got a full time job, so we don't have a lot of daytime stuff. When everybody comes back home in the evening, we don't have any trouble getting a truck on the road in a, in a flash. It's that daytime stuff. So, with this kind of thing, if we do get that kind of a bump, it's going to make it that much easier to have people here. Yeah, it's leading to the point where you know, the volume of calls that we answer right now, in my opinion, does not warrant having that full-time staff in the firehouse. It does not. There's other ways that they can manage that. It can be done on a per diem basis, or like I said, you pay somebody a stipend and they, all right, I'm going to be available this day. I can be in the firehouse in three to five minutes. I'll make myself available for that daytime slot. Those are the kind of things we can do to try to manage and not pay what it costs to pay for a full-time fire department because it's, it's ridiculous. Excuse me, quick question. Yes, for whatever reason, we needed mutual support from Dover Summer. We do Florida. every time. What does that cost us? Nothing. Nothing? Nothing. I've been asked many times about regionalization, and that's a big thing in other parts of the country where they have county-wide or region-wide fire departments. Mm -hmm. That really doesn't work here. They tried to do it years ago between Summersworth, Rochester, and Dover to make a tri-city fire department. But it's difficult because all the towns like their own little kingdom. They have a hard time sharing stuff. <laughs> I can't believe that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hard time. So what happens is we have what's called a mutual aid district. There's 13 communities that belong to the mutual aid district. And if we, in our shoes, did not have the mutual aid district, we would not be able to take care of half of what our needs are. And by that, what I mean is, we have a fire in town, we're going to call in our mutual aid partners, which is going to be, we already have a mutual aid automatic agreement with South Berks. So South Berks coming, Dover's coming, uh, Berwick, 
public's coming, all of our neighbors come to help us because we don't have enough personnel to do it. Nobody does. You go to a fire in Dover, we were in the fire, I used that as an example the other day, they had a fire on Central Avenue. There was 13 communities there and 70 guys standing in the street. Sometimes if I get a call here and we have a fire in town, I'm lucky if I get 10 guys. In order to be able to suppress a fire and do it correctly by national standard, you need 16 guys to step off the fire truck. Fire trucks. So you need like four or five of them to show up at any incident to be able to do it correctly, safely, and efficiently. That's how we get around the mutual aid. We get it because we turn around and give it back. We do an exorbitant amount of mutual aid in our community. We don't have that many fires in town. You know, knock on wood. We're lucky we may have four or five in a year, and they don't get to be very big. We're lucky that way. But we visit every other community that's around us whenever you see it in the paper or hear it on the news. We've been there. We're at these incidents. And we have to be able to give the mutual aid. We have to supply them with what they request, whether it's the engine company or the tank truck or whatever we have. We have to give it to them in order for when it's our turn, they will come and visit us. Exactly right. But as I said, we, we probably go out of town 50 times a year. We get it back here four, five. So we're, we're giving an awful lot to, to our neighbor community. So that's just the way the system works. Even if it, you know, I don't want to see it change. I like it that way. We go help them. So you know, we, that's why I reiterate again, we have a bunch of very skilled guys because we go fight for everybody else's time. So they're very skilled at what they do. Unfortunately, they grow wings and they fly off eventually, but that's just, it's just the way this community wants to accept that risk. It's the way the fire department has said at this point now, that will come a point in time where that will change. But right now, I think we're managing fine. If we can get over the hump that we discussed tonight, it'll be a huge step forward. All right. And thanks, Marcus. Yeah, good job. <laughs> <Any other> questions? <laughs> Mine's not the operating budget, it's the CIP, so I just want, well, Chief is here for him to talk about what I think are the two items uh, on the CIP that may be warrant articles that we would have to uh, address, but it's not the Charlie, operating Charlie, is yours operating budget or is yours operating? It's operating. Okay. No, my problem is if you wanted to get to 725, which is barely minimum, I know that, but see right now in this budget, 1,759. You go above that and your points and it's below the minimum wage. Even the $5,000 raise is only going to bring up 172 points. And that's 1931 to get your minimum wage. And you were talking 2,000 points and a quarter? Mm -hmm. Maybe. That's the point I was trying to bring up. I'm trying to get the numbers to figure out what it is. I'm not criticizing you. But I just want to know what the numbers are. Because yeah. most of you are new, but last year he wanted 10,000. And there was a and there was a motion for 3% got defeated. And I, out of goodwill, made a motion for 5. Not knowing what the uh, minimum wage was going to be enough because we didn't have the numbers. That way if we can get the numbers a little better, at least now we get an idea there's not a department here that's overpaid. I mean, this whole town, you can't pay everybody what they want and what they need. But there's certain people in this town that do need raises. That's the point I'm bringing up. Okay. on the CIP question then. Yeah, so on the CIP, there are two fire department. I don't know if they're, they're still going to come forward, but it might be helpful for the committee for you to talk about them. One is replacement of extrication equipment that is on the CIP for $30,000 and replacing a forestry vehicle, which is on the CIP for $55,000, scheduled to uh, come, in, come due next year. So, your question? Just, uh, I, the committee doesn't really understand. You know, the age of the current Forester vehicle the, or what the extrication equipment okay, is. Okay, the extrication the equipment is, is carried on utility and it's the jaws of life, as everybody's probably aware of. What we have now is a hydraulic system. It's 27 years old. It's well past its lifespan. In keeping up with today's advancements in technology, if we're to use our equipment on 
a 2018 vehicle, we may not be able to extricate the person out of it just because our equipment right now does not generate the amount of hydraulic pressure needed to cut through today's metals and whatnot on how cars are constructed. Also the technology, ours is a hydraulic type system, but the new technology nowadays has gone more towards the electric side of things. They're smaller, they're easier to handle, and I still can't believe it, but I've seen it because I've been to seminars, I've been in the training, and I've seen it happen. These electric tools are actually more efficient and generate more power than hydraulics do. I, I still have a hard time saying that, but I've, yeah. I've seen it happen. And the other thing is it's about one-third the cost. If I was to replace the equipment we have now in a hydraulic venue, it would be close to $90,000. I can replace it with better equipment that's more efficient and it's right up to date for $30,000. Would you completely abandon the hydraulic one? Or no, that would still be it. We would never get rid of anything like okay. that. We would use that for, we can still use that for all kinds of other things. It doesn't have to all, and we can even use it for still on extrication, but if there's certain things, certain types of vehicles that need different equipment, we need to be able to supply that. Right now, if I point to something like that, we're going to start, we're going to work with what we have, but if we know we're struggling and it's beyond our capabilities, mutual aid is the goal. Even some of our mutual aid partners here do not have a lot of proper equipment. So it's another system that everybody's having to upgrade just to make it so that it's available. So, so I missed the CIP presentations, but um, this is something that's been on the list that we've been running list. away for. Well, the reason why it's on time. the CIP thing right now is on last year's CIP, there was uh, there's funding available for us to get an air filling station within the fire station, which means that as we use our air packs and we drain the bottles, we can fill them in-house. Right now, we have to go to Summersworth to get this done. What I wanted to do was to take some of that money, a portion of it, because there's more there than, than what is needed to replace it, but because it was not, am I right, Caroline, you still there? Yes. It wasn't listed. It wasn't, was it wasn't listed, it wasn't written, so we could not use that funding now because the proper wording was not there. I didn't list that in the CIP line. So it had to come back full circle to where it is now. To start again, basically. Okay. That's why it's there. The we got two follow-up questions. Well, you go. Well, well, no. So also, I'd like you to talk to people about the force of people, but, but I do want to sort of clarify something that said, which we, we talked about last week, we talked about the CIP, that is, even though it looks like, if you look at the CIP, this is, looks like there's 20000 for this and 10000 for that, it, they're, they're markers, but at, every year the, the select board can rearrange those, so, and they can go, they don't even have to stay in the same department, and grab a 20000 that was sort of like in reserve for something for you, and, and, I don't know, put it for something else, and vice versa. So that's just... You know, that's just the legality of it. But, however, I mean, that's the guide. And, and so what the CIP committee worked with the departments for resulted in these two requests that we think will be warrant articles. One was for the extrication equipment, the 30000 and the other one is the forestry vehicle, which is a replacement as well. So maybe you could just tell me the old one, what the issues are. Forestry are. vehicles are 2000 it's having, it doesn't have a lot of miles on it. Most times when you get into fire department equipment, it's not the miles that makes any difference, it's the hours and what we're doing with it because it sits and idles and idles and idles for pumps and pumps and pumps forever. So that's where the issues come up. The other thing that drives the fact that the forestry needs to be replaced is the state uh, has developed what they call a task force response system now. We are part of that task force. So if there is a large incident in Concord. Concord is not going to grab all the resources from around their community if it's going to be a long duration thing. What the state is now doing is they'll often they, they open their operations community and they have a task force set up around the state. So rather than take all the local stuff and drain them, they're going to request a task force from the Seacoast, from the Keene area, from up north. We are involved in this with the engine company, the forestry company, and the tanker. So we have three different responsibilities that we could go to Key, we could go to Contico, we could go to Nashville because they don't want to drain their stuff. The forestry, in order to be within this uh, task force, is to have a minimum of 
space for four people. The one we have in our computer too. You can squeeze the third guy in if he's really, really small. Uh, it doesn't have the right amount of pump and equipment that it needs on it. Plus the fact that, like I said, it's 2003. We've been replacing brakes, fuel lines, radiators, the uh, shop we goes to the door to get repaired to tell me the frame is about done so it's basically falling apart around itself so it's just basically time to replace the unit and that's what we're hoping and it's in, what we want to try to do is get a four man cab type of vehicle similar to, and then have a body on the back similar to what the uh, highway department just got with compartmentation so we can put our equipment inside that the truck we have now has a skid unit on the back which contains a pump and a water tank it's removable, it slides right out. That unit itself is about $60,000. That would slide out of the old truck and slide right into the new truck. There's no cost for that. Basically, we just need the new vehicle and the transportation part to move that around. So it's that piece of manpower is what we're after to meet our requirements for being part of the task force response team. <coughs> Charlie. Okay, I got two questions for you, Mark. Uh, 153 radio equipment. I know the MOU for Dover is 44.52. Are you planning on two radios? The MOU yeah. is for... That, no, I know that, but then there's 10,000. Yeah, we're buying more portables. Two more portables. Two more portables. Okay. That's why that money was... Yeah, okay. Because we couldn't get it initially with the money that we wanted from the, the last Warren article to <laughs> cover all of our needs. That's what I was thought. Yep, so that line item went in there for us to incrementally over the next couple of years to get to the 20, which we need. Yep, that's fine. Yeah. And the other question is on the hoses. You haven't used any money this year. You didn't use any money last year. You're still going to level fund it. My question is... What's the condition of your hoses? Are they in good shape? Yeah, all the hoses is fine. Okay. The hose is fine. You know, the thing is with that hose, I know it's a line item and that's the way I should be buying. I have plenty of it there right now to handle what I need. Yeah. When, I, when I talked about adding uh, more funding to the protective clothing line, I need to put... Protective clothing is a 10-year lifespan. Yeah. I need to make sure that, that members are in gear when they go inside a burning building that is within that yeah. realm. I need to purchase three sets this year. I don't have it, so if I have to get it, my, my protective clothing line is depleted. <laughs> so guess what my hose is now becoming? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that plus, by having the it's three thousand. It's a priority. Thousand, i got to weigh which I need well, in the gear. Plus the three thousand. Right now. You could go out and damage three holes, hoses and have to buy them. I know. And you should get the money. Hopefully you don't, but, you know, you got to have the money no. in it. I, okay. I totally, and I understand your question. Yep. You know, even that 3,000 sounds like a lot for a hose, but one length of that large yellow hose you see laying in the street that's 100 feet long, it's $1,200. I for didn't one think piece. it'd be. It's $1,200 for one piece. One. <laughs> so, try not to run over it. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I hope you understood where I was coming from. I do. I do. I think the thing that kind of got me, maybe I started off on the wrong foot also, and I'm sorry if that's the way it came across. As I sat there for an hour and a half listening to everything else, that they're making this and making this and making this and making this and I'm like, man, I'm just so embarrassed to try to tell my people what they have. And, and I know the you know the dump guy is making 13 bucks an hour, and I got to pay a guy that risks his life or tries to save somebody else's life yeah. five bucks. It's tough. No enough tough money to go around for everybody. And I totally understand. Yeah. I, I really do. I really do, and I think that everybody's you know, committed tonight, and the questions that were asked were outstanding, and they can maybe understand a little bit more, but these are the guys that you, when you dial those three numbers, that you expect to respond professionally, be there in a timely manner, and perform their task. You've got to have them there to do it, and if we don't have some sort of compensation, that's a little bit more equitable. Because your budget's the same as the town, right? There's no changes? Okay, we don't need a copy of that. Thank you. Thank You're doing a real good job. Thank you. Try. All right, anything else? Not for you. I'm ashamed I could have sat for another half hour. Um, uh, next item of the, of the business was something that uh, Suzanne asked for, for clarification of, and so I'll let Suzanne. Yes, thank you. So I just wanted to clarify so that we 
we all uh, understand why I was chairing last week as strong as I am. And we have the vote on uh, emergency expenditure requests from the water and sewer. And we had six yeses, two, uh, I don't know, what three no's, three three no's, no's one extension. One. Yeah. And I nonetheless voted or, or, or announced that the motion had failed because we didn't have a majority of the budget committee, which had, we needed I mean, seven yes votes. And so I have here the RSA, the Budget Municipal Law, that talks about this. And it says, such application to the Budget Committee must be made prior to the making of such expenditures. No such authority shall be granted until the majority of the Budget Committee, if any, has approved the application in writing. So it is seven. It's not, it's not a majority of the people in attendance at, that, at a particular meeting. It is a majority of the Budget Committee, just as it is when we sign those documents with the budget that goes to the DRA. We need seven signatures. And we would have needed seven yes votes on that request. So just you know, kind of get a process here if you want. So okay, just a snippet. Pardon? How many yeses did you have? Six. 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 So now in any vote do we have for the budget committee has to have seven. This is a DRA. This okay. is for the DRA. Budget. It's yeah. under the emergency budget. Okay. Um, for it's, 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 it's under emergency expenditures. Yeah. Right. Just majority on any other budget line. Mr. Chair, we, we need to speak to that issue. Sure. Are we going to authorize him to speak like we had to? I'll make a motion that Vern allowed to speak. Second. Um, favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. Two things. First of all, the entire issue of emergency expenditures is now moot because we're not going to do anything until February, probably. The people on Willie Street seem to think they can wait. They feel it's okay to wait until April when the ground falls again. So it's absolutely moot. There is, however, one other thing, and that is we are the Water Sewer District is scheduled to present its budget on the 13th. The uh, commissioners have not yet met to have their workshop or to approve their own budget. And we're looking to have our workshop for the preliminary budget on the 16th, we hope, on a Saturday. And then on the 21st, which is our next scheduled meeting, to have uh, approved the budget, which is kind of odd to have a workshop and figure it all out and then approve it. But that's how it's done. So, we need to defer a bit, if you don't mind. <coughs> I just went through this with the, with the school. Yes. Uh, the, uh, we did put this out in what, May? April. <coughs> um, I mean, it is where it is, I guess. I just say that we're going to have to be budgeting earlier and next year when we're doing it. We're going to have to come in a little earlier. The whole SB2 has pushed us back. So I know people are coming up surprised at how early we're doing things, but that's just the way it's going to be as we go forward. Well, I think the committee will probably follow with that. Uh, not that I'm the one to say it. Um, so I I don't know. What, what are you proposing in terms of the day? Any time after the 21st of November. Because by then we will hopefully finalize and put it on our budget. <coughs> Uh, our our final meeting was going to be on the 18th of December. Which that was 18th of December. The 12th. Yeah, the 18th. Yes. Are you looking at the new? Yeah, for this for the 18th. Okay. That's a Friday. So we have we have two meetings to finalize the operating budget. One is going to be based on everything but the school, and then the following one is on the 18th to, to include the school, to follow up on any other, any outstanding issues in the school. So are you saying, I'm sorry to catch the dates, but did, did you say, you, when did you say you would be able to present? Or Hopefully any time after November 21st, after November 21st. 
So we would need another meeting, and I'm not. Would we, or could you just add it to one of the meetings? Well, November, the November 20th is our um, is the last meeting that we have with recreation in town. Right. We've been trying to avoid holidays and meetings cool. of the budget committee, so oh, that's, okay. that's what we have. To do Right, so so you guys wouldn't be ready for the 20th, which is the last one besides the school. They wouldn't be ready. They wouldn't be ready. Yeah, right, sorry. Um, and we don't want to do that on the same as the school, uh, I don't think. Okay. That's too much. Um, uh, Suzanne? None of this is pleasant, of course, but it, is it possible on December 4th to, for us to start at 530? Do Water district for an hour? Is that, do you think you would need more than that? Can we be first? Well, yeah, well, the rest is. We're, the rest would be deliberation over six. Huh? Wait a minute. What did you say? What day? The fourth. The fourth. We scheduled to meet the fourth, the fourth and deliberate. So. That's the school. No, that's, been, that's the old one. That's the old school. Yeah, the school's private one. Yes. Right now, the school is going to be on the 11th of December, and that, that got moved because they wouldn't have had their budget done in time. So what, instead, we took the fourth to deliberate on all the other department budgets. Um, but what we could do is come early on, what Suzanne is proposing, come early on the fourth, have the presentation from Water and Sewer, okay. and then go into our deliberations on the rest of the, the budgets. Um, it's, it, we do have another deliberation session after the school, so if there are outstanding questions on water and sewer that we felt we wanted to clarify, we would have another chance to discuss them at that next meeting. Um, so I, I, I think that's a good suggestion. How is the, do we want to have a motion for it? Or I was going to find that really the working person is hard. Yeah. Six I can make, but I guess sometimes I get about five. Six. Six. I get and we just go until it's done. So we'll move that, we'll move the presentation for the water to the district to uh, the fourth, and we'll start at six instead of 6.30. Can I make another suggestion too? I'm not going to change that, but I'm look, just looking at the budget. Is it, it at the schedule? We now have. Um, on the 13th, is that next week? Okay. Next yes. week. The library and town clerk, we were going to have water and sewer, so library and town clerk. I'm wondering, is, it, poss short. is it possible to have library, town clerk, and rec? And then maybe on the 20th, just have the town, and that would give us the ability to spend as much time as we thought necessary with the town on the, sort of the whole budget? Uh, I, I think that makes sense as long as the recreation oh, committee is able to. We'd have to discuss it. To get here and, and yeah. uh, I can't I can't give you an answer today. Yeah. Um, Sorry, what did you guys decide on? Well, we, it's a suggestion. We're we're most of the We have a so, meeting next week, um, so I can give you a better answer. Well, actually, we're meeting the uh, 12th. Um, so you're saying you want to. It was just the thought, 13th. The thought, yeah. It, 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 would, it would allow, it's not huge because if we have a short meeting next week, we have a short meeting next week. But it, it just, I wondered if it, by just having the town on the 20th, it would give us a lot of opportunity to just sit with you and talk about the whole, the big picture sort of thing. Can I, we're set then for December 4th, 6 p.m.? Okay. Back to you, Bob. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Oh, you're right, so entirely welcome. Um, I, I, have, I don't have a problem with, with that. But I have to ask the committee. Yeah, why don't we just check and if we can, uh, uh, yours, and yes. they're able to come, have them come. And I will let you know. I'll yeah. check with them tomorrow, and I'll get an answer and let you know if, it, if they can be here, because they're the ones that are presenting their own budget. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't happen, then um, we're going to have a... a because the library, as I recall, was a fairly short mm -hmm. presentation in the town, and the, yeah. the uh, town clerk is also short. So yeah. we'll be here for. I'm not complaining. Okay. All right. Ten minutes. A great meeting. Okay. So to be to follow up on that, um, any any other business that anybody wants to raise. Well, I can mention something that's not finalized yet, just to give you a heads up. Um, we've got our projection.
projected tax rate today. And just to let you guys know, potentially it's going to be, but uh, we have not voted on it yet. But um, this year is 24-12, and the projected for the new tax bills is going to be 22-46. I'm sorry, what, what was? 22-46. What was last year's? 24-12. Yes. Thanks to the school. Thanks to the school is what is a big chunk of it, and also um, the reason why I'm, I'm a little nervous about saying this because there's Don't something. Say it then. Don't want to. What's that? Don't say it. Then. Okay, okay, then. I'm no, uh, there's. Um, it's going to go up next year based on something that's happening um, with the tax bills. Um, so I'm, it's not going to be this way next year. I'll just tell you that because we won't have the school. So just know that, um, and you can't put it up. No. You, I mean, it's very difficult to put your tax rate higher than the recommendation by the Department of Revenue. Is you can bring it down and put some put some money for a fund balance, um, but you can't put it up. That would be difficult. It would be difficult. So that's what the DRA is saying. My, our tax rate might be. Yes. Yeah. Right here. So, yeah, so you hate to do that, but yeah, it's so just it's kind of, just it's a false feeling. Take it as a win. It. <laughs> enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it for next year, but it's Don't not going to be that way. Keep it in your right. savings account. Yeah. So, but I mean, you know, it will be like school, nothing against the school budget. Everybody will be like, this stuff. That's such a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you're right. You're going to get all the credit. Yeah. You're welcome for our hard work. <laughs> 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 Any other, any other business, Charlie? Selectman, when do you plan on to have a meeting on this? On what? On proving the tax rate. Uh, it's not set yet. Huh? It's not set yet. We just got it this afternoon. No, no, but you have to have a meeting. To... I, it's not set yet. It just okay. came today. Yeah. It will probably be part of our regular meeting. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor?